Um, our text for today is going to be John 15, verses 12 to 17. John 15, 12 to 17. Um, before we get there, I want to set it up with some thoughts about friends. One of God's good gifts to his people in this life is the gift of good friends. It is a huge blessing to have friends in your life whom you love deeply, who deeply love you, whom you can treasure the Lord with, and with whom you can share your life. Good friends make incredibly godly impacts upon the lives of their friends, and powerful bonds get formed among godly friendships that can literally last a lifetime and into eternity. And sometimes strong friendships, they can take a long time to develop. Sometimes it doesn't start off quick, but just over time you find you're really good friends with somebody. And other times it's almost instant. <clears throat> True godly friendships, they're very precious. Sadly, they can kind of be pretty rare. Uh, and if you have them, in my opinion, you would do very well to appreciate them, to not take them for granted, to invest in them, and to pour out as much love into your friendships as you can. A lot of times when people get comfortable in friendships, what they instead of being grateful for them and nourishing them, they take them for granted and start nitpicking them. And they start sabotaging their own friendships. I think that's a really bad way to approach friendships. According to the word of God, love for God and love for one another in the body is the greatest thing that we as human beings can experience. Paul said that 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest is love, right? We are designed to know, to understand, to believe, and to experience the love of God. We are also designed to know the love of godly friends in the body of Christ. We are made to receive their love, and we're made to give our love back to them and to God. And so without love in our life, without love for God, without love for the saints, our lives are utterly empty and meaningless. I don't think that's an overstatement. But with love, the love of God and the love of our friends, there is so much good that comes to us all the time. And so we, we, with godly friends, we cherish good times together. We, we celebrate each other's victory and blessings. We do it in an environment of receiving and giving love to one another. We also carry each other. We carry each other's burdens. We carry each other's trials and difficulties. And we encourage and strengthen one another and help each other through hard times and celebrate through good times. And if a person both receives and gives love to God and to their friends in the body of Christ, then they can get, I believe they can get through anything. And they can accomplish so much godly good. And people who truly are, know how deeply they're loved by God, who love Him back, who give godly love to the saints and who receive that back, those are the types of people where their lives are flowing with rich meaning and usefulness, and it brings incredible glory to God. So last week, we studied the passage about the vine and the branches. That passage taught us many things that are true of the believer who is genuinely united to Christ by faith. And building upon that teaching of what our life looks like when we are a vine who is truly connected, or I'm sorry, when we're a branch who's truly connected to the vine, building upon that is this teaching today on the priority of love and friendship. Love and friendship that we're to have with Christ and love and friendship that we're to have with each other. This is true of the fruitful branch. The dead branches will not pursue this. And we'll get to it in a minute. They will have 10 million excuses as to why they won't do it. So please turn to John 15, verse 12 to 17. I'm going to begin by reading the whole text so that I can make my first point. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And you're my friends if you do what I command you. 
No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command so that you will love one another. There's the section. I would like to make my beginning observation of this text by pointing out that this section begins and ends with a commandment from Jesus to love one another. It's bookended that way. And the fact that this section is bookended by the Lord's command to his people to love one another, it tells you how important this is. If you're a vine, savingly connect, or uh, I keep saying that. Here we go again. <laughs> If you're a branch, savingly connected to the vine, this is part of the fruit. Remember we said it bears much fruit, or Jesus said that last week? Part of this fruit is going to be loving one another. And the one another he's talking about, the specifics that he has in mind, is believers. It doesn't mean we don't love under unbelievers, but he's talking about believers here. We love one another. And so, these are commands. That's the first observation in verse 12 and 17. I want to think about what he said by considering what he did not say first. He did not say, actually, let me just say it again. I'm messing this up, and this is a good point. Verse 12, he says, this is my commandment, it's a commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. He did not say, this is my suggestion. He did not say, this is my preference. He did not say, I would think this would be really cool, but if it doesn't happen, oh, well, I trust God. This is my commandment. If you abide in Christ from last week, what do you do? Obey his commandments. If you truly love Jesus, what do you do? We've been seeing this week in and week out. Obey his commandments. If you don't obey his commandments, you're a fruitless branch that's cut off and burned. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, he also did not say, this is my commandment. If you love one another, uh, that, that you love one another so long as you feel like it, love one another. But if you don't feel like it, that's okay. He did not say, love one another if it's easy. He did not say, love one another unless you don't have an outgoing personality, then don't worry about it. He did not say love one another unless you've been through a lot of hard things that makes it difficult for you to love because of your trauma. He did not say love one another unless you don't feel like you're gifted at it. In that case, it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. He didn't say anything like that. There's no qualifier. There's no proviso. Love one another. That's it. And... If you're going to be a strong Christian, to be the type of person you ought to be, you have to set your mind and your heart, and you have to have this undying, fierce will that says, if God commanded it, that's it. It's all I need to know. There's no qualification, no excuse, nothing. Boom. How do I get it done? That has to be your settled mindset towards it. Being a tap a pastor for 10 years has taught me that people who are headed towards spiritual destruction, they tend to have 10 million excuses about why they can't love other people. And having heard so many of these excuses by so many people through the years, and then observing the fruit in their life that flow from these excuses, I can honestly say that during the times when I've observed people living out excuses for why they don't love, I can honestly say there was also nothing in their life that I desired to imitate as it pertains to their walk. I did not look at them and say, wow, I really want to grow like that and imitate that. I'm like, man, Lord, deliver them. There was no power in their walk. And as long as Christians live by excuses as to why they refuse to love the body, there will never be any power in their walk. And they're in danger of proving themselves to be false. Being a pastor for 10 years has also taught me that those saints whose lifestyle is one of showing holy love, there's something special about them that's incredibly different. Yes, they're still sinners and they're not perfect and all that stuff, but there's something different about them. There's this attractiveness to their walk. There's this 
sincerity to their faith. There's like this intensity to their commitment to Jesus. And if you have the spirit, you feel drawn to people who genuinely love, who are who, people who are like this. They're a total gift to the body. They're a joy to be around. And I want to pause right now and just say uh, to you guys, I publicly acknowledge before God to thank you guys for how you've loved our family. You guys have shown us this. And it's a great joy to me to see it. And I think when the word, the word challenges us, we need to just take that on and respond. But we also need to celebrate uh, when there are good things present. And I, I really believe this. Everybody in this room, you guys have all loved our family in some really wonderful ways. And it hasn't just been one time. It's been a lifestyle of love. So good job. And thank you. Um, and... Uh, anyways, I think most people would agree that uh, even even unbelievers, I think, would agree with this, that loving one another is really important. I don't think there's probably not any argument here um, with that. However, I think the million dollar question is, how do we love one another? Now that, especially in Pride Month, uh, there's going to be a lot of theories about how do you actually love someone. Fortunately for us, we don't have to speculate about the type of love Jesus is talking about because he tells us in verse 12 how to love each other. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So in, in here we see Jesus tells us, love each other as he loved us. And so the starting point for how you are to love your brother in Christ is understanding how Christ has loved you. That's the starting point. This means that if you're going to love someone rightly, you have to know how you're loved. And if you don't know how you're loved by Christ, you're not going to be able to show the love that he has for you. You have to know that. You cannot give what you haven't received. You cannot show what you don't understand. So how has Jesus loved us? I mean, we could probably spend like the next 50 sermons talking about that, right? Uh, that's a very overwhelming topic. What I'm going to do to try to make it simple is just stick to the flow of thought in the text and go to what he emphasizes. There's countless ways that he loves us, but let's just look specifically at what he draws attention to right after saying, love one another as I've loved you. He says, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. What's that a reference to? The cross. Exactly. And so... According to Jesus, the greatest way in which someone can, can be loved is for their friends to lay down their lives for him. And so Christ himself is the preeminent display of this reality. He laid down his sinless, perfect, holy life for sinful people so that we might be forgiven and reconciled to God. And so the heart of his love and friendship with us is that he did whatever was necessary to bring us into a holy relationship with God, even if it cost him dearly. Now, when you look at this shade of the love of Christ towards us, that he died for us, do you get for the, the impression that Jesus would walk up to sinners and say, man, you're such a great guy. You just need to tweak your ideas about God a little bit. Of course not. Bound up in this reality that he laid his life down for us is why did he lay his life down for us? Because we're sinful. So Jesus is not going to, as our good friend, pretend that we're somebody that we're not. He doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't say to, to his people, hey, you guys are amazing. I believe in you. He says, you guys are evil, and I have to die for you. That's how he starts a friendship. Great way to make friends. But that's how he does it. He understands, as our friend, the truth of who we really are. And then in knowing the truth of who we really are, Jeremiah read in, in, in this psalm, that there's no one who does good. 
Jesus doesn't just see that and then destroy us. Jesus, at great cost to himself, does something to change it. He dies for us. And he dies for us at great cost to himself in order that we might not only be forgiven of our sins, but that we might gain God. And when Christ laid his life down for his friends, he was, how did that play out? He was constantly insulted. He was torturously beaten. He was given over to humiliation and shame. He died a physically grueling death on the cross. Nails are driven through his hands and feet. Like that's the, to me, that's the worst one. Like, I don't know about you guys. My hands and feet are really like, eh, don't touch me kind of thing. And, and he's got like nails going through him. That just had to be excruciating. He has a crown of thorns upon his head that ripped through his scalp and caused blood to drip down his face. And then when one dies on a cross, does everybody know how you actually die when you're dying on a cross? Yeah, they, they break their legs. Nope. Suffocate. You suffocate to death. That's how you die on a cross. That's how you actually die is by suffocating. Now, the reason they break their legs is so that you can't push yourself up so that you can catch, catch your breath. They break the legs and then you can't push yourself up and you just sit there in the blood like pools and you basically suffocate. It's horrible. And then worst of all, while dying on the cross in indescribable physical suffering and in so, you know, kind of from a social standpoint, all this shame and insults that are he's being buried with. In addition to that, he's taking on the wrath of God when he paid for our sins. There's nobody living who knows what that's like. Nobody. That's how he's loved us. Here's a question of the rhetorical variety. Is there anything convenient about this love? What if Jesus didn't have, you know what, Lord? He says to the Father, you know what, Father? I don't have time for this. This is too inconvenient. What if Jesus said, hey, Father, you know what? I'm just not gifted to die on the cross. Or if Jesus says, you know what? You know, dying on a cross just doesn't really fit my personality. Or what if Jesus says, you know what, Father, I just don't feel like I click with sinners. It's like, of course you don't. Or what if Jesus says, Father, I just don't have anything in common with sinners. Well, then, yeah. So because of all these excuses, Lord, I don't have the gift. I don't have a personality that just dies on a cross. Um, I, I don't have anything in common with sinners. I don't click with them. It's inconvenient. I don't have the time. If Jesus said all these things about the cross, we're in trouble. And so here Jesus tells us, love each other like I loved you, laying down my life. And so in the light of this commandment that we've received from a crucified Savior, these are the ways Americans tend to talk about love. And it just doesn't square with the Word of God. It doesn't. It does not square with what Jesus is saying. Jesus didn't also say, look, my whole life people rejected me and they were really hard on me and made fun of me and tried to kill me. And there's too much trauma and I can't go through that again. I'm going to sh shrink away from the cross. He didn't say that. He didn't. None of the excuses. And, and there's probably 50 million others that we could interject in this. None of that stuff is in Christ. He is secure. He is alive. He can get through hard things and still continue to love in hard ways without excuse. And he's saying, this is what you're commanded to do as a vine, or as a branch that's connected to me. We're not God, FYI. Just, just clarifying. Of, <laughs> of, keep calling us a vine. My bad. It's always got to be something, it seems, every sermon.
Um, so, <clears throat> sorry, I lost lost my lost my place here. Jesus pours himself out unto death for his people. His love was incredibly costly. It wasn't comfortable. And he calls us to love each other like this, and yet we have all these bogus excuses for why we won't do it, and then we feel justified in it. According to Jesus, your holy, perfect Savior, and according to the scripture that's inspired by the Holy Spirit to pour oneself out for his friends, it's the greatest love. Jesus isn't just talking the talk here. He's walking the walk in a deeper way than anyone ever has or ever will. It's a costly love that Jesus gave to us. And he says he did it for his friends, which is the church. Now, interestingly, there's something true about the friends of Jesus. He gained friendship through the cross. Well, how did those people start out in relation to him? Are they always buddies? No. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 3, in Colossians 1, 21 and 22, and many other places, that we were his enemies. Romans 5 says this too, verses 6 through 11. Through his death on the cross, through him making atonement for our sins and bringing us to salvation, his enemies, when they receive him through faith and repentance, become his friends. He is the initiator in the friendship. Jesus himself, through his sacrificial love, turned his enemies into eternal friends. And I believe when Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. To me, I, 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 at least in part what that means is he knew people who are hostile towards him are going to be saved by his death and will turn and will become his friends. And he takes pleasure in that. And that's part of the joy that was set before him, that he was why he was willing to endure the cross. He knew what the cross would produce. And so here's my point. Though the love of Christ was very costly, it was incredibly rewarding. What's the reward of his suffering? The church, his friends. Real love is like this. If we are the branches that are united to the vine and we see that the vine loves his friends in this way, then what has to come out of us? The same thing. The pattern of our lives towards our friends is that we joyfully and sacrificially display love to each other. Real Christ-like, spirit-filled love produces real and genuine friendships that are godly and spiritually rich. Sacrificial love, it bonds us to God and it bonds us to each other. And to me, the cool thing about real love is that when it's shown to you, it has this potential and power to produce great love in the one who receives it. When someone loves you greatly, you're like, ah, oh, awesome. And then like your response is you want to then reciprocate that. The world calls it like paying it forward. But I don't know about you, but that's how I feel. When somebody shows me some great act of love, it's so encouraging and refreshing. It strengthens my own love to give to others. That's how this works. But unfortunately... So many friendships lack this love. So many friends do not love as uh, like Christ did and laying their lives down for each other. So many friends abandon one another if they didn't get to pick the restaurant they went to lunch for. So many friends avoid one another when one friend is going through a hard time and their hard time inconveniences them and they're like, ah, this is not healthy. This isn't life-giving or whatever the phrases are. This isn't, this is toxic or what, what do you mean it's toxic? Your friend's mom died and she's sad. Like be there for her. What, what's the matter with you? You think it's helpful for them? You think it's good for them? Enter into their suffering and love them. So many friends abandon one another when being friends with a true saint means you may not be popular with a certain crowd. All of a sudden, see ya. We're friends, 
And then being friends with someone means this group doesn't like you. And then also just, you're like, what happened? No one will ever tell you because you're cowards. These are the satanic friendships that, that exist. And there's, there's tons of examples. So few people are willing to work hard to display love and build godly friendships because at the end of the day, they're just super shallow and selfish. Those are the facts. Or maybe they just prioritize the wrong things. So many opportunities to bond and love with other believers are regularly just chucked because people are fixated on having to have certain things take place in the exact right moment of time. I'll give you an example. You don't know this person. So I knew this man who <coughs> one time he was seeing his grandkids for the first time in months and they invited him to spend the day with them, but he couldn't. You know why? Because he had to water his perfect grass at the exact right time. And then he had to return a purchase that he had made a few days earlier. And then he had to get an oil change for his truck because his truck was already 47 miles past the due. Sorry. I haven't seen you in months and I have a chance to love, with you, love you and spend the day with you. But I'm 47 miles past the due date on my oil change. Ah! It's nonsense. It's crazy. It's like, really? What, what, what if? I mean, what if? Let's just think about it. Let's play what if Marvel style here for a second. What if we're in a universe where your perfect grass had one blade that's slightly yellowed, but you were loving somebody during that day? I mean, what if that happened? What horror would come to us over a one blade of yellow grass? It would be awful. That would be awful. I can see why you would totally want nothing to do with your grandkids that day. Because, oh, the horror of a blade of yellow grass. Unfortunately, this is a true story. And unfortunately, there are countless examples of this type of love all over the place. There is the priority on all the wrong things. I mean, could you imagine the terror of your truck being 112 miles past the oil change due date? What horror would befall the people of God if that happened? It's just, it's, it's nonsense. It's a joke. Like, it's a joke. That is, a, you, you are focused on all the wrong things for all the wrong reasons, and you cannot love. That is not a branch connected to the vine. And so, <laughs> real love, point one, Christ's friendship with us, and he tells us we're to love like he loved. Real love means people are a priority and I will sacrifice myself for their holy good. And it's not always going to be convenient or easy or not awkward or pain-free. It's not going to always be that way. The people, so many people only love when the stars line up perfectly and it's totally convenient. That is antithetical to the love of Christ and it's sin. There's one little caveat. This doesn't mean you can always do every opportunity that presents itself. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean there's never a time to say no. There's times where you stop throwing your pearls. There, that, that exists, but I'm not preaching on those categories today. I'm preaching at the others. So if you want to talk about exceptions, we can talk about that. They exist. But this is about your lifestyle towards the body. So <clears throat> let's keep going. Let's continue our study and look at how we have friendship with Christ and what, how that implicates our love. Okay, a real quick roadmap for the rest of these verses. I'm going to explain how Christ is our friend through each verse. And because he tells us to love each other the way he loved us, 
at the beginning and then tells us to love each other again at the end, I'm going to then make an application about if we see how Christ loves us a certain way, this is how we love each other. That's how we're going to work through the text. So let's go ahead and move to the next level of or layer of friendship uh, that we see in verse 14. Jesus says, you're my friends if you do what I command you. There you go. What did he just command? Love one another as I loved you. So if you refuse to do that, you and Jesus, you're not friends. You do not get to wear the Jesus is my homeboy t-shirt. <clears throat> Verse 12 and 13 shows us how Christ initiates friendship with us by dying on the cross in our place. And verse 14 shows us how to respond to his love that invites us into friendship. And that response is to obey him. If you want to be friends with Jesus, you have to obey him. Now, this has been a fascinating theme all through the Gospel of John and the Uproom Discourses, specifically chapter 14 and 15. We have seen Jesus repeatedly tell us, if we love him, we'll obey him. John 14, 15, 14, 21, 14, 23. We also <clears throat> saw that if we, if we love him, he will reveal himself more and more to us. The Father will, will love us. Christ will love us, and the Trinity will make his home with us. John 14, 21 to 23, John 15, 10. And so adding to these already wonderful realities that are ours through obedience to Jesus, he now tells us here, if we love him, we're his friends. If we obey his commands. Obedience shows our love. Obedience gives us a home with Christ. Obedience... Uh, brings friendship with Christ. Jesus died to produce the right kind of friendship with his people. And it's a friendship that we can see. He says, if you love me, you're my friends. If you obey what I command you, it, this is a friendship that thrives in holiness. Jesus is not a bad friend. He's not going to just watch us live in sin and walk in evil and then act like there's no impact upon our friendship. If you want your life to be one of friendship with Jesus, you will obey him. And if you don't obey him, you're not friends. Now to help us feel this idea or this reality with Jesus, not just an idea, that our disobedience is going to disrupt our friendship with him, I want you to think about your relationship with other authority figures in your life and how that's played out. As kids, if you're disobedient and rebelling against your parents, your friendship with your parents in those times isn't as close as it could be. If you're rebelling against your boss at work and you won't do your job, your friendship with your boss is going to suffer. If you refuse to do your homework and pay attention and you act out in class all the time, your friendship with your teacher is going to be hindered. If you refuse to have a good attitude and work hard and actually run the schemes we're running in sports and you rebel against your coach, you're not going to you're going to disrupt your friendship with your coach. So it's not any, we, we can see this in our life that if we are friends with an authority figure in our life and then we just sabotage it by rebelling against them, it's going to impact the friendship. It's not any different with Christ. You are my friends if you obey what I command you. So if you want your friendship with Christ to thrive, then it has to begin by you accepting him as your Lord and Savior, believing his death on the cross brings you forgiveness and a relationship with God. And from that point forward, your friendship will grow as your obedience grows. That's what he said. They're my friends if you obey me. Because he loves you, he wants what's best for you, and he wants your friendship to bring glory to God and to produce holiness in you. And Jesus isn't so desperate for you to like him that he's going to stop laboring for holiness in your life. He's already poured out his life for you so that you can be saved and reconciled to him in friendship. How much more will his ongoing friendship with you have the aim of producing holy obedience in you? That's how he's your friend. He laid down his life for you to save you. 
It tells you to obey God. This is what forms your friendship. Now, in this context, part of us obeying him and showing we're his friends is us doing what? Loving one another as he loved us. That's, what, that's how the section began. So, if you refuse to love the saints, you're not just hurting your friendships with the saints, you're also hurting your friendship with Jesus. If you're my friend, you obey me. He just gave you the command, love one another like I loved you. These things are so connected. We talked about, you know, a little while ago, you know, church membership and why it's so important. Like, and I'm not talking about formalities. I'm talking about the reality here. You cannot break up your relationship with God and your relationship with his people. They always affect each other. Always. There's this organic spiritual union between you and Christ and you and Christ's people. You miss, you disobey God, it's going to affect your relationships with people. You mistreat God's people, it's going to hurt your relationship with Christ. That's how it works. And a real Christian has to care about this. And if we're in disobedience, we saw last week, God's going to prune us if we're a real branch. And we have to repent and find his forgiveness and get up and love God and love other people and put away the excuses. So Christ's friendship in this verse towards us means obedience. So if we're going to love how Christ loved us, which is the commandment in verse 12, then what do we have to love each other with? What has to be the aim of our love towards one another? Helping each other to obey, right? If you have two friends who love Jesus deeply, those friends strengthen their own friendship by encouraging one another to obey Jesus. And when a spirit-filled saint sees their believing friend obeying Jesus, it should be cause for the strengthening of our friendships. I get super encouraged and excited when I see you guys, my godly friends, obey God in some way. I'm like, awesome! I love that dude! That gets me excited. Why? What's the theological reason? Why do I feel so encouraged when I see Christian friends obey God? There's a spiritual power, but it's not just, oh, well, he's a pastor. He has to feel that way. There's a deeper theology to this. My own friendship with Christ is strengthened when I obey him. We're called to love one another in the same way. So, okay. When you obey and when I obey, our love and friendship is going to be strengthened. And in disobedience, it's just like it weakens your friendship with God. It's going to weaken your friendship with the saints. In extreme cases, it will break it. Turn to 1 John 5, 2. I want you to see how deeply connected our obedience to God is to our own love for each other. Jesus has been telling us, if you love me, you obey my commandments. The same is true. If you love God's people, you obey his commandments. 1 John 5, 2. By this, we know that we love the children of God. Here's the evidence. When we love God and obey his commandments. Isn't that fascinating? I love you, bro but I am in utter rebellion against God. Is that true? True statement? According to 1 John 5, 2? Absolutely not. It's like, bro, you don't love me. You're walking in sin. Well, that's just between me and my own personal relationship with God. That's not between us. It's like, you're wrong. You're dead wrong. If you take the name of Christ upon your lips and say you're a Christian, and you walk in unrepentant sin, you are not loving me. 
Even if your sin is stealing from your work and I have nothing to do with that place, you're not loving the body when you walk in unrepentant sin. That's what 1 John 5, 2 says. There is no such thing as walking in sin and then deceiving yourself. Well, this doesn't hurt anybody else. It only hurts me. That is dead wrong. We love one another when we obey his commandments. Well, if that's true, isn't the opposite true? We don't love one another when we disobey his commandments. This has to shape your theology of friendship. Real friendship has this sacrificial love that we talked about that is displayed in the cross, and then it also labors for holiness. That's the type of love you're to show other people. And that's the type of when people are loving you that way, those are the people you need to value as friends. And so where sin and pettiness and selfishness and disobedience is harbored, you can be sure that the person's friendship with the saints and with the Lord will begin to erode. So friendship is with God and the saints. Holiness is like this power that sustains it and grows it. Next layer of friendship. Let's go to verse 15. And this, we're back at 1 John 15, by the way. <clears throat> no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. Here, Jesus compares the difference in the relationship that exists between a servant and his master and that which exists among friends. Generically speaking, a servant doesn't know what the master's doing. He just sort of serves the master. But there's not like a close relationship involved. Oftentimes, he may not even know the master. I think if we put it in modern terms, let's say you worked at a business and you don't know the owner. You just kind of know what the you know what the commands are and the duties are for your job. And so you just do it. I doubt Liv knows who owns Panera. You just do your thing. That it, It's a very distant relationship. Here, master says this, servant does that. Jesus says, I don't just call you servants anymore. I call you friends. Because though God does command us and we do obey, it's not at the same level as servant master where there's this distance in our relationship. Instead, that happens in the context of friendship. A saving relationship with Jesus brings us friendship with him. And specifically, he says here that we're friends because he's not hiding what's going on. He's revealing to us what his father has told him. That he's coming near to us. He's coming near to us through what God has said to him. I'm letting you in on this stuff. We're friends. And obviously when Jesus tells his friends what God has told him, it's going to help his friends know God more. I mean, that, that's a kind of a no-duh implication. And so what I see in this statement here, when Jesus talks about us being friends with him, he says, I'm telling you what God told me. We see this characterization of friendship is real friendship helps each other know God. As our perfect friend Jesus knows our deepest need is to know God. So he commits himself to being the type of friend that's proactively helping us do that. There isn't a better friend than that. Our friendship with Jesus, it's built on this reality as well. It's built on the cross. It's built on obedience. It's built on us knowing God more as Christ reveals him to us. You will never understand the love of Christ as you ought if you fail to realize that one of the greatest ways in which he loves you is helping you know God more. That's his agenda for your life. That's how he's a friend. I tell you what my father told me. How does that happen now for us? Jesus isn't going to appear in the body and be like, Hey, Noel, 
man, it was crazy. Me and the father were talking last night. We were hanging out with some angels, and here's what he said. Like, that's how it happens. He reveals himself through his word. And so, <clears throat> if we're going to love like Jesus, and we're going to be the type of friend that Jesus is, then as we look at verse 15, the spiritual principle here is friendship means helping each other know God more. Unlike Jesus, the Father's not going to directly talk to us in heaven, and so we're not going to have these direct revelations from God to relay to one another. But we do have God speaking to us through His Word. And as we regularly take in the Word of God, we can be a good friend by relaying to our friends that which God is showing us in His Word. And so when our friendships are centered on helping one another know God more deeply, our friendships become far more powerful. So now we see real friendship, according to Jesus, has at the heart of it us helping each other know God more through the word. This is how to be a good friend. This is how to recognize a good friend. This is how Jesus is your friend. Verse 16. Let's learn some more about friendship here. Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So here we have in verse 16, this claim of Christ, which tells us in no uncertain terms that those whom he has saved, who have become his friends, remember the context, vine and the branches, the real vine or the real branch that's connected to the vine, the ultimate cause of this friendship. It's not us choosing him, though we do do that at some point. It, the ultimate cause of it is not us choosing him. Rather, it is him choosing us. The Lord sovereignly chooses his friends. It's like it says he chooses us in Ephesians 1 for adoption. It says in Romans 8, 28 and 29 that he predestines us to be conformed to the image of Christ, to be his brothers. God chooses us to be his children. God chooses us to be the brothers of Christ. Jesus chooses us to be his friends. He is the initiator. I'm going to preach more on this. I'll probably give an entire message to this at least at some point in the upper room discourse, but it is not this day. For now, he chooses us for salvation first. That's what he's saying. You didn't choose me, I chose you. And so as he chose us for friendship, we're going to see that there is a purpose to him choosing us. What's the purpose? According to verse 16, the purpose is, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Do you ever feel like you don't have a purpose? You don't have like a destiny, like, I, I don't, what am I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what, you know, is it? like this tells you. He chose you for friendship. You'd be friends with Jesus. And he's given you this destiny. He has appointed you for something. And what he's appointed you for is fruit. What's fruit? According to our context. It doesn't have to be some huge, spectacular ministry that's written about every week in, you know, the 50 super dopest Christian ministry magazine every month. You know, it doesn't have to be like this thing that's published and everyone remembers, you know, a, a thousand years from now, everybody says, oh yeah, man, I remember what Will Utesh was doing in 2025. Like we don't have to be in history books. We don't have to be known by the world. We don't have to be famous Christians for us to have some sort of ministry or fruit that counts. That's not what the fruit is. The fruit isn't famousness. That's, is that a word? It's not fame. There you go. That's easier. 
What is fruit in context? Obeying his commands. Obeying his commands? What else? Helping others to obey his commands. Help others obey. Sacrifice yourself. Love the body. We'll see prayer here in a minute. Love Christians. Love God. Obey God. Repent of your sins. Help other Christians love God and know God in the word and grow in holiness and be there for him and pour yourself out for him. And if nobody ever applauds you for it, and if nobody ever cares, you know who does care? God, you're living in your destiny. Like, man, Christians have way too small of a view of themselves. It's like in our celebrity culture, even the Christians do this. There's about 30 preachers in the whole world who count according to, you know, Gospel Coalition or whatever other crazy thing that puts forth the celebrities all the time. Listen, your walk with God is absolutely epic. You have a destiny. Just like the Nuggets have a destiny to whack the heat tonight. They did, they did, you have destiny before God in your friendship with him to bear fruit. It's so epic. This is like Endgame looks so boring compared to this. This is awesome. You're chosen to bear this fruit, fruit that will last. Do not think for a minute. Your fruit bearing, whatever it is, giving a cup of cold water, Jesus says to one of my prophets, loving someone, praying for someone, encouraging someone, correcting someone, forgiving someone, bearing with them, helping them obey, doing a Bible study with them. This is your destiny. It's so cool. Open your eyes. So many people get seduced by it's got to have this big fame and Las Vegas lights over it. You'll probably go to hell if that's what your ministry is like. Like, dude, this is awesome. Love this. Appreciate this. Rejoice in God for this calling on your life. He appointed you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. It lasts when you help someone overcome an addiction in Christ. It lasts when you help someone come out of sin. It lasts when you lead someone to Jesus. It lasts when someone's depressed and you help them be encouraged and press on. It lasts when somebody's in need and you help them and you meet their needs. That's something. It lasts forever. A lot of showy things like kind of don't last. They kind of just fade and they're gone. There's one little in the moment spotlight. Woo Later. This stuff lasts. It's enduring. It's rich. It's the Shire. And they say things are made to endure in the Shire. Like this is fruit for God grows in the Shire of normal Christianity. Hallelujah. Put, make a shirt for that. <laughs> If you want to have purpose and meaning in your life, you don't need the hype. You don't need to be celebrated by Christianity Today, which is a bad magazine. Um, you don't need any of that stuff. You need to just do the simple things of the Christian life. And there is so much meaning in that. There is so much purpose in that. This is a fruitful life. This is a life God is super pleased with. It doesn't have to be to 10 million people. It could be to three. You want a super dope life? Be friends with Jesus. Obey his commands. Lay down your life for your friends. Help them know God better. Help them obey the Lord. That's your destiny. You want that? That is so rich. And friends like this are incredibly fruitful and their ministries are super powerful and they're going to impact eternity. And I'm very much looking forward to bring us, Jesus bringing the sheep forward and saying what you did to the least of these you did to me. You gave him food, you gave him water, you gave him drink, you were there for him, you cared for him. Look, Jesus said many who are last will be first and the first will be last. 
there are these first in the world that they're the cool guys and all that stuff. A lot of those dudes are not even going to be saved. We're going to be like, whoa. And the last, these little flea bag losers, you know, over here that the world doesn't like. That's us. That's what I get to the world. We're all flea bag losers. Yeah, hey, man, well, we don't care what the world thinks. The Lord ain't going to say that. We're the last. And then when it comes forth, the last will be first. It's going to be changed. And everybody's going to be like, bro, this isn't going to be like graduation. I said this last week. But you know, with graduations, all any, it, it is one, two hour, some cases longer. It is a two hour lie. It won't be that way at the judgment seat of Christ. He will show. My hair, check out my friends. I chose these dudes and dudettes. We were homies. They obeyed me. I laid down my life for them. They laid down their life for their brothers. I helped them know me. They helped each other know me. It was awesome. Here's this fruit. It lasts. These are my peeps. Jesus country, let's ride. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was bad. Um, anyways, this is real friendship is Christ choosing us and giving us a destiny. That's how he's our friend. Here's the next layer in which he's our friend. Verse 16. <clears throat> So you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in my father's name, he will give it to you. So now part of our fruitfulness and our friendship with God is prayer. Whatever you ask in the father's name, here's a promise, a conditional promise. Whatever you ask in the father's name, or I'm sorry, in the name of Christ, the father will give to you. What does it mean to pray in his name? Define it by this context. We saw it a few weeks ago in a different context. I think it means multiple things. If you're just looking at this context, how do we pray in his name? What's affiliated with our praying here? According to his will. Okay, according to his will. What else? What's, what's going to be fuel to your prayer life if you have verses 12 to 17? Okay, I'll tell you. I got to do this for three hours the other night where I got asked a bunch of obscure questions with no preparation. That was fun. Um, <laughs> here, with my question, you get a little taste of it. Anyways, praying in his name in context, what have we seen? I, praying in his name understands Jesus laid his life down for us. That's what it says in the text. Praying in his name means we're walking in obedience to God, and if we approach him in prayer and disobedience, we're approaching him to repent. Praying in his name no, it would pray to ask God's help that we might continue to bear fruit in this life. Praying in his name would include, Lord, help me know you more in the, in the word. Jesus, you said you've revealed all that God has said to you. I want to know that more. That would be part of praying in his name. Praying in his name would mean, Lord, help me love this Christian in my life or give me the opportunity to love them, or provide for me to love them, or I'm struggling to love them. Help me to love them. Thank you, I can love them. Here's the different way. Give me wisdom about how to love them. I'm not sure. That's what praying in his name would include in this context. Lord, I pray in your name. Thank you. What a friend we have in Jesus. I thank you that we're friends. It's these ideas. I'm approaching God in the name of Christ, praying along these lines. And as you are, what's the promise? He'll give you what you ask. Answered prayer is part of your friendship with God. Your life of obedience, love, sacrifice, and service to the saints, according to the word of God, fueled by prayer, knowing he chose you for this destiny, that type of life's going to have a lot of answered prayer. Who is bearing the fruit? Think vine and the branches. Who's bearing the fruit? You or Jesus? Both. So now you can see friendship with Jesus, and we're praying and talking with Jesus about this, means being on mission with Jesus together. 
How many friendships are forged out of people serving a common cause? They forge powerfully. It's the reason war vets are a lot better friends than people who golf together. Common mission forms bonds. Part of that friendship with Jesus, we're going to live out this command to love. Being undergirded by his own love for us. And as we bear this fruit for his glory, we're going to pray. And God's going to work in us and through us. And we're going to make choices to love and to sacrifice. There's going to be all these answered prayers. And we're on mission with Christ in doing this. That's part of our friendship with Jesus. He doesn't just say, you're all vile wretches and I saved you. Now just sit in the corner with a dunce hat on till I come get your wretched selves. He doesn't just say that. Like he saves us because we are vile wretches, but he makes us new. He makes us friends. And then he brings us into the knowledge of God. He brings us into obedience and he commissions us to love. And he promises that that's our destiny. And he will answer prayers along those lines. Sweet. So as we consider that this in verse 16, Jesus gives us a destiny and appoints us to mission and to fruitfulness and answers prayers and partners with us in that. If that's what his friendship means in verse 16 to us, then how do we show the same type of friendship for each other? A good friend, a Christ-like friend is going to help other friends who love the Lord realize you have a fruit-bearing destiny from God. And whatever ways you're walking in that's bearing fruit in the Lord, man, I want to encourage that and aid that or join it sometimes. Or maybe you're not sure how to do it. Okay, cool. A good friend, I'll help you get going maybe. Or, you know, that's part of friendship, being on mission together with each other. Obviously, as friends, human friend to human friend, prayer is going to be part of that. This isn't just an individual pray and I'll, the Father will give you what you ask. Pray together about our joint mission efforts here and our joint expressions of love. Let's pray about this for fruit. We're going to pray together. That is a good friend. A good friend who encourages you in your ministry and in your love and who prays about these things with you. That's what makes up a good friend. And so we've seen in verses 12 through 16 how Christ is a friend to us. Or actually verses 13 to 16, how he's our friend. Verse 12 was this command for us to love each other as he has loved us. And now we get to verse 17, how this section ends. These things I command you so that you will love one another. So for the second time we've been told to love each other. All this teaching about friendship with Christ began and ended with a commandment for us to love one another. So as you understand how he loves you, as you understand how he's a friend to you, then you turn around and take those realities and you love and be a godly friend to the saints. So here's a quick review. Christ's love for us meant he died for us on a cross at it was great cost to himself to bring us to God and bring us into friendship. We're to model the same type of love, of sacrifice. Christ's friendship towards us brings us into obedience with him. We are to be the type of friend that labors for each other's obedience. Christ's love for us meant showing us all that the Father had said to him. Our friendship with each other is helping one another know what God has said and know the Lord better. Help, help, help each other know what God has said in his word. Christ's love to us is reminding us he chose us for a destiny to bear fruit. Our love towards each other is we're going to bear that fruit towards each other and encourage each other in fruit bearing ways. Christ's love for us is that God is going to answer prayers that are said as we are living these things out. Our love towards each other is we're going to pray with each other that we might live these things out. These are the parallels between God's Christ's love for us and his friendship towards us and our friendship for each other. So 
So, now that you can see this, who are your friends? You need to think about that. Who does this in your life for you? The people who live this out, and none of us are perfect. Who lives this out in your life? The people who do that are the most loving people in your life. They are the best friends in your life. Sometimes when you live this out, people will tell you you're not my friend. Do you support the LGBTQ movement or are you homophobic? That's how people talk. There's only two options. It's like, nah, there's a third one. I don't support it at all because I'm your friend. And so think about who your friends are as you understand what friendship is in Christ. And as you think about this, man, appreciate that, love that, nourish that, care for that, grow that, strengthen that. And if you find yourself, I feel like I don't have friendships like this, then pursue them. So I'm going to now, I haven't asked you for any comments mostly yet, but I'm going to now. What are some things people believe is true about friendships that are totally missing in this passage? I'm friends with someone if, and it's just not in the text. Jeremiah. Unconditional acceptance. Okay. The same age, same interests, the same emotions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good. Same age and interests. That is not in here. What else? I think friends, uh, someone's your friend who's older you are and can help you grow in Christ through wisdom and prayer and things like that. Okay, good. That's true about friendship. But my question is, what's not in here? Jeremiah says unconditional. Will says same interests and age and hobbies and everything. Anything else you can think of? I didn't hear anything about, I didn't hear anything about older people. Oh, I see what you're saying. Their influence, who they are. Okay. Whether they're popular or not. Yeah. Right. What's their What's their status in, in 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 life? Like, he didn't say anything about that. And don't be your friend unless your problems are too overwhelming. Yeah. Then you can't. I mean, that's happened to me before. Like, yeah, I know. This, yeah. Is, this is too much. You have too much going on, and I can't handle it, and so I can't be your friend. Yeah, those are real statements. Yeah. Jeremiah. And social status. Yeah, exactly. That's totally missing. None of that makes up a good friend. You may have common interests. That's good. If you have, that's not evil, but it's not necessary. So, I think this is super important for everybody. Everyone in their life. So many times we are looking for the wrong kind of friendships and we understand friendship the wrong way. And because of that, have you ever wondered? I know some of us, some of us maybe are going through this now, some of us have gone through this before, where you felt like, why are there not more people in my life that like I are kind of like me? And God won't give it like the same, like Will was saying, the same age, the same interest. And God withholds that from you. How do you think that could be love towards you from God, that he withholds that? What do you think he's trying to help you see? It's not a requirement. Yeah, it's not a requirement. And when you learn it's not a requirement, you learn about real friendship. What is a requirement for real friendship? Loving God. Love God. As he loves you. Okay. Yeah. All the things we went through, this is what a real friend is. And so when you look for friends by looking for people of who understands the gospel, who's saved, who's obeying God, who loves sacrificially, who helps people in know the word better, who's on mission, who's bearing fruit, who's prayerful, who's going to help me live into that, those are your best 
friends. And then, in uh, uh, like manner, there are people we can think are our friends who try to pull us away from all that. They're not your friends. You might like them, that's fine. You might want to win them to Christ, that's fine, but don't let them pull you away, and it's not friendship. James 4.4 4 tells us friendship with the world is hatred towards God. In this, in the way we're talking about friendship today, like you can't, Christians can't, hopefully you know what I mean by this, what I don't mean. We can't be true friends with the world, meaning we're bonded together. We're about the same types of things. We're going the same direction. In that sense, we'll never be friends with the world. Should we be kind to the world and, you know, interact with them? Of course we should, so that we can try to save them. But we're not like friends. They're not our people. It's two kingdoms. It's two words, the people of Christ and his enemies. It's, in our context, fruitful branches and dead branches. So you have to understand this. This is so, so important. There are people in your life that you might think are your friends that are not. And the way you measure this is not, did they irritate you sometimes? Or, you know, they root, they're rooting for the heat tonight or you know, whatever. The way we measure this, are you walking in these things? No, you don't walk in these things. Then you try to pull me away from that. That's not a friend. And then you measure your friends. Are you walking in this? Do you help me walk in this? Sweet. These are my friends. Anyways, anybody have any thoughts or I didn't have a friend my age when I got saved for years. And I thank God for that. My friends were, I was 22. My best friend was 45. Other dude in my life was in his four other people. Everyone was in their forties at this time of life for me, for some reason. It was like, I, I don't know why that was the magic number, but it was all these 40 somethings. And I'm this random 22 year old obnoxious person who just got saved. And I praise God for it because it just taught me what to value. And I remember when I got saved, that really stood out to me immediately. So I was never like that as an unbeliever. I would only hang out with people who were into my niches and my kind of sin. And then as soon as I got saved, anybody that had a heart for God, all of a sudden we were BFFs. And that was very compelling to me. When I was like, well, I remember I would just talk to the Lord about it. I was like, this is crazy. Like, all of a sudden, everyone's interesting to me. Before that, it was like, you know, 2% of people were interesting to me. Uh, you know, now, all of a sudden, it's different. I love that. And this is for a Wednesday night group. How does this relate to the Abrahamic covenant? Because it does big time. Your people will be my people. Okay. How else? Good. Who are the people? Yep. Abrahamic terms. Seed of the woman. Okay, good. That's garden terms. How about Abrahamic terms? The nations. In you, all nations will be blessed. Think there's a difference between a someone who lives in poverty in Mexico and a rich person in England? A little bit. But when those guys become homies in the Lord, that's awesome. The United Nations is not going to pull this off. Not. Michael Jackson did not succeed with Heal the World. That did not do it. John Lennon did not do it with Imagine All the People. It did not work. Unifying deep, different people in deep friendship, that work belongs to one, Jesus Christ. This is why it's really important for us when God puts us in a body together, we're like really different. I swing a sword like a baseball bat. Jeremiah knows that's like insanity. 
I don't know why it's insanity. I just, it's what I do. <laughs> but swords don't make us friends. I'm guessing Jeremiah has a bad jump shot. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what makes us friends. I would pass out with anxiety just looking at Jason's tools, let alone trying to think about what to do with them. I have no idea. That's not what makes us friends. Will had to explain some part of a bike to me yesterday that probably nine-year-olds know. He was explaining to me what it was on Wednesday night, telling me the story about a snake being in there. But, okay, that isn't what makes us friends. We don't have to have every single worldly thing in common. If you have this, you have everything, you have love, it is so much more powerful and real and lasting. It's fruit that will last, according to verse 16. So, anyways, Jeremiah. Thank you. We talked about this for, for our young folks. That some days you're looking for a husband and wife, there's a huge application. Yes. Find someone that loves you this way, marry them. Yeah, there you go. There's our resident Chuck Worldry here of uh, the love connection. <laughs> Maybe that's a, two people know that's an old one. Yeah, amen. Anything else? All right, well, let's go to the table. We're going to close in prayer, go to the table, and celebrate our friendship that Christ bought at the table. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're our friend in this way. Thank you that you call us to live into this same type of love with one another. And God, I thank you for how this has been displayed in our body in so many ways. We rejoice in that, Lord. And I pray and ask you by your spirit to please forge more fruit in us. I pray in the areas of loving people where we need to be pruned, that you will prune us, that we might bear even more fruit. And we thank you for all the good in our midst, Lord, and all of the there's so much fruit here, Lord, we couldn't even eat it all. We thank you for that, and we pray for more. We love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.